our New Testament reading and preaching text can be found in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. If you are with us in the sanctuary, and I guess from what Fred said, you're only with us in the sanctuary unless you're listening. There might be a few people listening in. Um, that can be found on New Testament page 211 if you want to follow along in the Pew Bible. 2 Timothy 1, 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, for the sake of the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I am grateful to God, whom I worship with a clear conscience as my ancestors did, when I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I am sure lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Do not be ashamed, then, of the testimony about our Lord, or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. And for this reason, I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know the one in whom I have put my trust. And I am sure that he is able to guard until the day that I have entrusted to him. Hold to the standard of sound teaching that you have heard from me in the faith and love that you are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. This is the word of the Lord. So as we get started today, I want you to think about why you're here. Why did you drag yourself out of bed this morning and come all this way to get here? Why are you participating in a Christian service? Now, I know some of us will think about, well, it's because of what I believe, that the Christian understanding of who God is and what God is about is similar to what we believe, and we're here to hear messages that lift us up and take us further in our faith. A few of us have had radical Uh, conversions. And we went, we literally went from one lifestyle to a very different lifestyle. And we're here to continue building ourselves up and understanding more and more about God. I find uh, in gatherings of this size or bigger, there's always a few that um, got here just by studying the Bible themselves. I have a buddy who's uh, family members are in a group that's probably known as a cult, and they, they kind of always used to be trying to get him to believe what they believed, and finally he just said, you know, I'm going to read the Bible myself, and he started out reading the New Testament, and he found the Jesus that he encountered in there very different from the Jesus that his family was telling him, and he started following Jesus just in that way, kind of all by himself. But my guess is that a lot of us are here because of someone else that invested in us. Parents um, are probably the most common in these situations. A lot of us have had parents that showed, showed us the way of Jesus and helped us to understand how we follow him. But there are often others that have been active in our lives. And I bet several of us, uh, we're just seeing pictures and and seeing all these memories that we've had of people who really invested in us to help us understand Jesus' call on our lives and how to respond to us. 
Who are the people that invested in your faith? How did they invest in your faith journey so deeply? Maybe they were a pastor that you just connected with, a Sunday school teacher or someone that just took time from you. I've got this friend who, he's a pastor and he has his doctorate, he's doctor so-and-so, and he said, I have not had a better Christian education than I did growing up in my Sunday school class. And that was not a slam or a, a negative thing that he meant towards his seminary. He meant that his Sunday school class growing up was that good. He said, there was this woman in our church that started with us when we were very young, and she followed us all the way through and trained us and taught us. And many that came out of that class went into Christian service and ministry. They were just so empowered by it. What about you? What did the people that influenced you the most in faith do? Did you meet? Did you talk? Did you read the Bible? Did you study? Did you pray together? I guarantee at least two things happened. Number one, I know these people, if they really had influence on you, they cared. And that they were available to you. I guarantee no matter what else happened, those two things happened. Today's text gives us a picture of a mentoring relationship. And as we get into this, we need to start with who are these two characters that we're talking about, Paul and Timothy. Paul is the Apostle Paul, the Pharisee known for persecuting the church, who had this radical conversion on his way to persecute the church in Damascus. Timothy is one of the younger men that Paul has influenced. And now he's kind of left the fold and he's out doing what Paul did out on his own. Paul is one of Timothy's sponsors in the faith. And sponsor is the image of leadership that we are looking at today. A sponsor is someone that helps us develop in the faith. To think of Jesus in his role as a rabbi with the 12 and the disciples and the crowds. A sponsor is the one that builds them up, that gives them the direction, that helps them understand how to go forward. What does this sponsor relationship look like? Well, according to this chapter in the Bible, Paul encourages Timothy, he teaches him, he prays for him, he advises him. There are all kinds of levels. You know, sometimes when we look at a biblical text, it feels like an onion. When you peel an onion, you have all those different layers. This one has a lot of different layers, from just little encouragement to deep theological training. All of that, everything in between, Paul is covering. He also speaks of Timothy in family language. The Bible often does this. And I think it does it for several ways. First of all, they're trying to bring together groups that don't get along very well. You know, in our day, when we think about ethnicity, we think about all kinds of different things. In their day, they typically thought of it too. You're Jew or you're Gentile. And as people started following Messiah Jesus, they found themselves in these gatherings that they started calling churches, these gatherings where Jews and Gentiles were coming together, and they didn't have that experience in normal life. They tended to go, you know, I don't like those people. They're different. They do things differently than I do them. But yet as they're called together, the church uses this language as family to tear down the walls and bring them together. I think there's another reason that the family language was used so often. In their day, often following Jesus, and you see this many times in the New Testament, they refer to how many times it split families up. That often the decision to follow the call of Jesus on your life meant that your family abandoned you. So many of the writings uh, refer to that, that we think it was probably a really common thing that the family said, hey, if you're doing this, then, then we're done with you. In fact, it's really likely that the Apostle Paul went through that himself, that the decision to quit uh, being a Pharisee and to follow Jesus was a decision that took him away from his family. What you also might notice here is even though they're using father and son language as family, 
The family and the development and the sponsorship relationship isn't just male to male. Paul talks about how Timothy is a legacy in so many ways. Your mom was a follower. Your grandmother is a follower. You are a true follower. What we often see when we get into the Bible is these understandings and ideals and these relationships that often we put in certain categories. It breaks out. Even in this heavily chauvinistic um, society, Paul is talking about women lead. Women do things here. I hope these types of mutually empowering relationships exist in all of our marriages. But I think it's important that these kind of relationships happen with other people as well. Our marriages do better when other people are influencing our, the people that we're married to, our spouses. We need others around, calling us to grow in our faith, walking alongside of us as we succeed and fail in life, and showing us a picture of another way. You know, we naturally in marriages influence each other. We're around each other so much. But we also need other relationships that help us when we get stuck that encourage us, that do other things in our life. This is why it's so important to have at least a couple of different ways set out to grow in your faith. I think there are uh, lots of different options for this, but I'm going to kind of speak in generalities and speak in kind of two different spheres. The first one is a big gathering of some type. A gathering that brings people together that we don't normally interact with, um, that aren't in our social circles, that maybe even think about life differently than we do. The gatherings like what we do right here that have this, kind of the big gatherings that we do in our two worship services. We need that because that pushes us and builds us in a certain way. But we also need a smaller gathering. A gathering where we can share, where we can talk about life, where we can wrestle with things, where we can say, this part, this is really hard for me. What does that look like with you? So this is more those mentoring relationships that we're talking about today. Somewhere where others can pour into us, somewhere where we can pour into others. A church that my family used to be a members at years ago, um, had this uh, unique thing that kind of happened. Um, they had a real, they're a little bit like us. They had a very top-notch audiovisual team. And they did all kinds of different video and audio presentations, all kinds of really cool stuff. And people in the community that visited our church, sometimes for um, funerals and sometimes for civic events and stuff that wasn't even associated with our church, they'd be like, man, those, those folks are really good at what they did. And if they were techies, if they were involved in that, they'd always head up to the, the balcony and end up talking with them about what was going on. And they'd see what their equipment was. And many times people started saying, hey, could I, could I be involved in this, what you do? Can I get involved in this as well? And we started seeing people coming into our church to be involved with the audiovisual stuff, people that had no Christian background, no involvement in that. And as they interacted with these people that were wired a lot like them, they also interacted about Jesus. And it's been fun, even though um, Lynn and I haven't been in that church for about 20 years. Uh, we're still friends with so many people on Facebook. And we see that these people are continuing to grow because there was this attitude that uh, in that group that we would not only um, you know tell you about Jesus but we'd walk with you and share life and all that and it was a really beautiful picture Timothy's well-being mattered to Paul he uses words like I'm grateful for you I long to see you I want to be together relationships like what we're talking about in sponsors they're not just hey we like to hang out they deal with tough stuff. They do training. They help equip. Paul is doing that here. But Paul is also talking about a real difficulty that might be coming between he and Timothy. And it's a little subtle, so I want to kind of highlight it here. 
At the time Paul is writing this, he is in jail. He is in prison for his actions of spreading the gospel. As Paul uh, started preaching something that just sounded radical and wrong in their day, he regularly found himself in trouble, both with the religious elite and with the governments of the day. Because often what it sounded like he was saying is, you know, ignore your government, your king is Jesus. And they're like, I don't know who this Jesus guy is, but calling him king is a problem with us. So Paul finds himself in jail. And in their day, they had a, and from where they are, they have a very unique uh, challenge that they need to do with this. Um, he, Paul is worried that Timothy is going to be ashamed of him being in prison. Not that he's going to be worried like, hey, next they're going to grab me or anything like this. But he's going to feel like, Paul, you know, being in prison is a really shameful thing. It's a really wrong thing, and it could bring shame on my family for my association with him. If you are familiar with how different parts and different cultures in our world understand things, this tends to be a more Eastern than Western understanding. Uh, if you're good friends with somebody from an Eastern uh, point of view, you can ask them about that and help them explain how shame runs through some of these, these cultures. It's not purely Eastern and Western, but that's a little bit. So Paul is walking into this hard thing and going, I'm not in prison because I did something shameful. I'm in prison only because I talked about Jesus. And his call to Timothy is not to feel shame over this, but to understand what is really going on and not be messed up by the problem. As we partner with each other in order to get through the difficulties that we will face in this life, we need people in our lives. We need people that invest in us, that help recognize what God is doing. When we're going through stuff, we need people who are there with us facing these hardships, but also to recognize the opportunities that God is putting before us. It is so good to hear others uh, confirm what we're seeing or sometimes go, hey, I don't think you're hearing this right. I think God is leading in another way. Paul's advice doesn't just depend on the individual getting through it. It depends on something that is outside of themselves. For Paul and all good sponsors of the faith, having God in their lives doesn't eliminate difficulty, actually far from it. It makes them recognize difficulty and work towards uh, going against it. It gives them courage to confront life and to have hope, no matter how challenging things are. So as we come together in these groups of twos and threes and more to live life together, reminding ourselves that God is in control. Now, we are hopefully in the tail end of a pandemic. We have been going through this uh, for some time now. And this has chipped away at what we think is the basics, the, the basis for how we come together in these small gatherings. We've had less ability in the last 18 months or 20 months in how to do things as we normally do. But you know what, I, as I was thinking about this this week, I think it's really important now to realize that life often gets in the way of things that matter. And life, and especially this pandemic, have worked to get in the way of how we build each other up and how we grow. I don't think the answer is to ignore it and just say, well, we're walking into it and whatever we get. But I think we need to say, how can we continue to go forward despite the challenges we're facing? Think about it. In normal times, all kinds of things get in the way. Career, family, just regular life challenges all get in the way of our faith development. We aren't supposed to uh, just say, it's okay. We need to ask, how do we go forward doing the best to work around the challenges, but knowing that at times we're going to get caught up by it? You know, um, but it's not only that we go through these times now, now and now and think of what we're dealing with now we also have dealt with these over and over in life uh, think about as we go through history all the challenges to our faith development 
for a lot of times, um, being a person that followed Jesus put us in direct conflict with the kingdom that we lived in. Um, being open about being a Jesus follower got you thrown in jail, got you hung, got you burned, got you all these terrible, terrible things. But they weren't always like that that messed with our development. Also, times of war or other pandemics or deep uh, problems. Um, I think of the Great Depression. I, I'm not sure that that, was, that made uh, growing in our faith the easiest of all those thi- things. But through these things, we still need to find these opportunities, these places where we can invest in others and others can invest in us, where we can say to each other, God is still moving. God isn't out of the situation just because this is hard. Paul dealt with this exactly while he was dealing with the things about being in prison. And instead of being prohibited or having Timothy run from it, he walks right into the situation and says, this is what's really going on. Now, my guess is that many of you have read how frustrated Paul was by the limitations he faced by being in prison. My guess is he begged God daily, like, God, let me out of this. I'm not getting done what I need to get done. I've got all these churches that I need to visit. I've got all these places that I need to do things. But what did God do? God helped him see how he could do something even in the situation that he was in. He helped him write these letters to encourage even though he couldn't travel. And then God, in the way that God often works, did something miraculous with these letters. These letters are the majority of our New Testament. These letters didn't just encourage one church or one person or a group of people. These are the letters that we read 2,000 years later that tell us which way to go during hardship, that show us that God is still active and still pursuing us despite whatever is going around us. God used these letters for something way bigger than Paul ever could have dreamed. The Apostle Paul gives his young friend Timothy this amazing pep talk to lift him up and to refocus him. Although Paul would have rather gone to him, God used this in a very different way and did more with it than anything he could imagine. As you invest in others, as they invest in you, things will happen that are beyond your ability to believe. Change will happen that not only lasts a lifetime, but it lasts a generation after generation after generation. Find the big places where you can gather. Find the small places where you can be invested in. Be a sponsor. Be sponsored. This is the way that God invites us to join into his plan that allows us to partner with him as he grows his church. Trust God with one of the most precious commodities we have, our commodity of time, and see if he doesn't do more with it than anything we can expect. Join us at First Presbyterian Church Sundays at 11 a.m. in our sanctuary or live streamed on our website or watch us on My 11 every Sunday morning at 9.